This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, one, two. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 25 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else related to Young Justice and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. (laughs) I knew we'd buy you! Auntie Mouse will be so happy, Kid Blast! Thanks, Wonder Woman! But now we have to find treasure for Daddy! And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Overwhelmed. The release date was August 27th, 2019. The in-episode dates are February 14th through 15th. The writer was Greg Weissman. The director was Christopher Berkeley. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. In addition to the regular cast and their familiar characters, we also have Troy Baker as Todd Donner. We'll get to him in a bit. Crispin Freeman as Gregor Markov and Jim Harper, Phil Lamar as Double X and Metron, and Nolan North as Baron Bedlam. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode starts with a GBS broadcast that fills us in on the aftermath of the Team League mission from the last couple of episodes. So, what has been going on is that 316 Metatines have been returned to Earth and placed in the Taos Youth Center. Cyborg has officially joined the Outsiders and become a public hero, and the footage he took exposing Granny Goodness's evil plan has been released to the public, though Good World Studios has publicly denounced it as a complete work of fiction and special effects makeup, and our founder totally isn't an evil alien. Don't worry (laughs) about it. (laughs) After all that, uh, we then cut over to Star City, where Artemis comes home to discover that Will has put together a lovely Valentine's Day dinner for the two of them and they kiss, I scream, Uh. the credits roll and we cut back to Artemis pushing Will away and running off crying to make a phone call to Zatanna and I'm just gonna rush through that because it's a lot it's a lot we then cut over to Connor and Fred in the bio RV having a conversation about whether Forger should stay on Earth or return to New Genesis Forger's conflicted, he wants to stay on Earth, but can't safely be himself. So to help him make a decision, Connor takes him to Geranium City. What initially seemed to be a perfectly normal small town is revealed to be Genomorph City, home to all of the Genomorphs Connor helped free from Cadmus, masquerading as humans around outsiders, you know, like regular outsiders, not like capital O outsiders, uh, through the use of psychic illusions. Connor starts introducing Fred to all his old friends before we cut over to the premiere building in Hollywood where Halo is babysitting Leon. Brian's on the TV, hyping up the Outsiders on the news, before we cut over to him and Tara meeting secretly with their brother before Tara texts Deathstroke that Gregor is out of Markovia. We then cut over to Artemis, who's meeting Zatanna at that same willow tree in the park from back when Zatanna had her meeting with Dr. Fate, uh, and we all cried, and it's time to cry again, uh, because also here are McGann and Raquel, who Z brought along for moral support and to deal with the traumatic aftermath of what Zatanna is uh, maybe going to do upon Artemis's request. Because Artemis is insistent that Zatanna bring Wally's ghost back from the dead, uh, and Zatanna is insistent that not only can't she do that, she shouldn't, because Artemis needs to heal and find closure on her own without resorting to wild magic. <laughs> But once Artemis threatens to go to Wotan, if Zatanna won't help her, uh, Z relents and agrees to transfer Artemis' soul to Limbo, where she'll be able to speak with Wally until the sun rises. But if she doesn't leave by that deadline, she'll apparently be trapped there forever. More on that later. Uh, Zatanna casts her spell, Wally appears to Artemis in a beautiful white dream space, and we all cry at their reunion. (laughs) 
Back at the Premier Building, everybody's looking after Leon when Metron suddenly appears and kidnaps Halo, Cyborg, and Leon before transporting them to some unknown space in the universe. He talks to them for two seconds, saying he's proud and warning them that they present great obstacles to Darkseid's plans, and then he just drops them all back in the living room. <laughs> That's all that happens. That's a full subplot. That's it. Pretty much that's it. It's like, hello, and goodbye. Back in back in limbo, Artemis and Wally get to live out a fantasy where they're married, working at Stanford, have a baby, a dream that Artemis never wants to leave. Back in Geranium City, Double X tells Forager the city's backstory, but also explains that they are still forced to live separately from humans or hide their true selves, echoing Forager's own struggles. Forager decides to join the Outsiders as a public hero, as a way of helping all aliens and genomorphs live openly on Earth. Double X thanks him, but also calls out Connor for helping individuals, but doing very little to help the genomorphs as a whole enter society. Gut bunch. We'll talk about it's that in a good. minute. What would Superman do? Ah. In Limbo, Artemis still refuses to leave her fantasy world until it all starts to unravel with the briefest of questions about how it works. Wally's spirit then encourages her to seek help and move on and find love and live her life. After finally getting the closure that she's been seeking, Artemis exits Limbo and reappears in the park and makes us all cry, where she thanks Zatanna for helping her. However, as they're all leaving the park, Zatanna reveals to Rocket that she didn't actually summon Wally's spirit. In reality, Zatanna and McGann work together to create a mental playground in Artemis's mind, and Artemis then filled in the blanks, essentially, imagining the entire scenario. And then, that'll I'm sure that won't have any lasting consequences in future seasons. Back at her home in Star City, Artemis apologizes for running out on Will, but they both agree that the idea of them having a romantic relationship is just too weird to work. And we all breathe a very big sigh of relief. And while all of this was going on, the light broke Baron Bedlam out of prison and helped him stage a coup for the Markovian throne. You know, also, <laughs> as, a, as a bonus. And Brion announces that he'll be leading the Outsiders to save Markovia and all of that. Save his homeland. And that can't possibly go wrong in the season finale. I, I, it'll be fine. It'll be the best it's thing. It's fine. It'll be the Everything's fine. Candle on the cake. It's fine. Let's feel the aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So I have a. I have a. Can I? Can I have a couple sure. things? Sure, Rich. To start go ahead. With? Be all excited. Right. Cool. Todd Donner did not know Todd Donner. Joshua Lappin Bertoni, who uh, wrote up a bunch of all a bunch of different things as far he they, he he was on our show, of course. Uh, on the discussion episode, and then we were actually uh, talking about how he writes the, you know, what spoilers and, and Easter eggs he can find. For DC Universe, to clarify. Oh, yeah, sorry, for DC Universe, yeah. So, I actually, <laughs> when I was looking up Todd Donner and trying to research who this person was that I didn't know, there's a whole piece here that I will just share with you. <laughs> he, uh, he says, uh, Todd Donner, t- Todd first appeared in 1987's Captain Adam number three, written by Kerry Bates, uh, where he hosted his own news program called Night Zone, an homage to Ted Koppel's uh, real-life Nightline. And then Greg Weissman, looks like he also wrote him, uh, co-wrote 1989's Captain Adam, number 34, with Kerry Bates. Uh, but there is also a note in here, which is great, that Todd's first appearance in Young Justice is actually not just in the animated series, uh, in the Young Justice Outsiders, number one. The tie-in comic that came out, um, and it was Torch called... Songs. Yeah, it was. We know Emily's going to remember this title because it's a comic that dates all my favorite things. <laughs> it puts it all in the thing. Uh, written by Greg Weissman and penciled by Christopher Jones. Uh, Todd Donner uh, is the moderator of the panel in that as well. And then another thing that was interesting that I didn't catch even in the slightest, and I probably <laughs> should have. Double X is Mayor Dabney Donovan. Yes. In the comics, Dabney Donovan is the scientist, cracked, unethical scientist who created Double X in the first place. That's what it says. And there's a little cut. You, you, if you go, we'll uh, see if I can get a link to this. We'll put that in. And you can see, uh, it looks like the mad scientist was first mentioned in Jimmy's and uh, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, 142, before being fleshed out in 1990's Secret Origins 49. 
yeah, so that's pretty cool. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, this whole storyline with this perfect world that you need to pull out of, including having a child. Like, there is, I think I can safely say my favorite episode of Justice League Unlimited was called For the Man Who Has Everything. Do you remember yeah, that one, Emily? It's so good. And then I became a father, and now I just can't watch it. <laughs> it brutal. Brutal. Where basically Superman is trapped in a utopia and has to level and destroy all of his dreams to uh, escape. And the finale of that with Mongol is, I'm like, feeling every moment of it. And this is really that, that feel echoed back to this for me. With that, just as a side note on that episode, because it is such a good episode, watching it for the first time, one of the things that killed me about it is because you also see like Batman's version of Utopia and Superman's is so complicated and so many specific dreams about the future and getting this perfect life and having a child with Lois Lane's. Batman's version of Utopia is his dad punching the mugger in the face and that's it. That's it. And that kills that's me. It. Yeah. It's just just beating up Joe Chill. Hi. And not being dead. Whew. Yeah. And that episode's real good, guys. Go watch it. Yeah, it's it's real good. Go find it, go watch it immediately. Yeah. But if if you wanna like watch it back to back with this, yeah, it'll it's be fine. fine. Collect together all of yeah. the episodes that do things like this and cry about all of them back to back, and then you'll be dehydrated. Right. God, that scene with his son at the end, it's just like all I can do is picture my kids and like, Don't uh, do that to yourself, Rich. It's too late. <laughs> So, back to back to talking about Young Justice. Do you have anything else or you want me to dive into my stuff? Uh, mostly, I just want to cry about for the man who had everything and then point out some of those interesting things that I meant. Totally it's a good missed. thing to cry about, and they're good, interesting things. So, I fully support you. Yeah, absolutely. So, my random stuff to go through and make sense of my very scattered, emotional, excited notes about this episode, because I have a lot of feelings about this episode, guys. Uh, to start at yeah. the beginning... Cheshire, not Cheshire, yes, Cheshire, but not quite what I was trying to say there. Leon saying, now we have to go find Cheshire for daddy. One, this kills yeah. the Emily. Two, <laughs> give me more of this precious child being raised by her wild ninja parents. Because this line, this is <laughs> totally. meant as a throwaway joke. And it, every time I hear it, sends me off on just down a rabbit hole of being like, how much does Leon know? <laughs> how much have we told this child about her assassin mom? I have so many questions. <laughs> I want a spin-off sitcom that is the Harper Wen Croc family and all of their shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be the uh, it would be the WandaVision equivalent for you, uh spin-off TV series. Right? Do people understand how excited I am about WandaVision 2? Like, that's my jam, guys. <laughs> but on the other end of the spectrum, in terms of things I don't love, we all know the first time I saw this episode that I screamed my head off when uh, Artemis and Will kissed because, nope, don't want that in my young justice. <laughs> But the fact that it was immediately followed up with Artemis going, nope, I can't do this was validating was very emotionally validating as i screamed i may have i may have yelled at stephanie lemlin <laughs> it's when not it her fault no it's totally yelled at her it's definitely stephanie lemlin didn't write the episode it wasn't her choice <laughs> i just i just looked at her and went and yelled stephanie she was like just wait just wait <laughs> just watch the episode just watch oh, the episode. Yeah. No, because that was how all of us felt. We were just like, no. And then the credits finished and we're like, maybe acceptable. Oh, okay. We shall see. <laughs> we shall see. But yeah. uh, from that rewatching it this time, I hit me real hard watching her run into her bedroom and apologize to the picture of Wally. Like, killed me. Just that, ah. Uh, yeah, it's just, I can't even explain all that, but it's a good detail, like not just having her, like having that directed at something and having it be an object and having it be just this shadow of a memory of the person that she's apologizing to that she doesn't even need to apologize uh, to and having, seeing how she's processing right. that, like that two seconds of right. screen time tells you so much about how Artemis is 
processing or rather not processing everything that happened two years ago. This episode. This episode? Yeah, that's a pretty apt description. So to move away from sobbing about Artemis for a second, because my notes are always in chronological order, which may not be the most organized, but is just how they are. Connor and Forager in the Genomes and Geranium City, ah, is one of my notes because I love this subplot. (laughs) It's precious in the weirdest superhero specific way possible. Like in very, like there are very few media types of media that you can just be like, here's a city full of cloned, weird looking creatures and have me respond with, oh gosh, I love it. It's so cute. (laughs) Yes. But in this, they're just Absolutely. like, here's Karen. She's a behemoth wandering monster of a thing with giant teeth that could crush you. And I'm like, I love her. She's adorable. <laughs> She's precious. And I love her. <laughs> Snuggles. Yes. Hug all the monsters here. They are good <laughs> kids. <laughs> Related, I love and noticed that Connor knows everyone's name it's very nice he's a very connor's a good kid (laughs) this entire portion of the show is just me calling everyone a good kid but it's true connor because it's not just like connor being like look at this utopian society he's like look at this utopian society where i know everyone by name where us as viewers are just like i can't keep track of the designations of these creatures and connor's like bill ted karen Craig and I'm like you're magic this boy is magic <laughs> I I also love so way back in the day yes back in uh bow hunter security uh Neil Neil had a note that I didn't understand at the time and I don't think it ended up getting into the episode and it's be- it was it was when when Roy tells Jim you spend too much time with your geraniums. Yep. And I didn't get it at the time. And I was like, I don't even know what this means. And we were like, we were just, we were, you know, so I don't know if it ended up getting into the episode. And now I get it. I think it was on our like full review episode maybe or something. Or it might, it might have been, yeah. it might have been our first scream something about this. It, it was might listed have been. as one of them and we might have. A lot happened. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. And then we went back and, okay, good. I'm glad I mentioned it back then. But now is the time to also call back. Because it's good. It's a good little foreshadowing because you don't even it's know good, it's foreshadowing yeah. until you look back and you, you know, go, oh. <laughs> yeah. So I have a note here that simply says there's a tapas place in the city populated by experimental clones, which is a really weird roundabout way of me saying, I love that this city looks so normal. <laughs> Like, if you look at the way Geranium City is designed, it's a completely normal town. Like, when they when they drop the mental illusion, it's only on the people. The town looks completely normal. Oh, yeah, normal. the town's the same. Oh, <laughs> Whether the, the same. illusion is up or not. And I just love that concept of all of these, like, I'm sure there are parts of the city that are differently designed to accommodate all of the different sized creatures wandering around here. You got to design for effective purpose to allow everybody to do their thing. But I love that in general, <laughs> the city just has perfectly normal architecture. <laughs> it's like, like there's like, they just, it's good. They show Main Street and I'm like, everything is a normal store, <laughs> but they're all run by experimental clones. Yeah. It does make me wonder, you know, like where Karen and her friends fit in. I don't you know. You know what I mean? Maybe everywhere has outdoor seating. The simplest, simplest. So it must be in what, like Southern California, Florida? Like, do they even say, do they say where it is? No, I think, I feel like it's around Happy Harbor because they just take the RV, I don't know. I assumed. Oh, yeah, they took they took the RV. Well, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't say much either because then the RV can just change and then come back. Fair I don't know, enough. I'm not sure. But the fact yeah, that they drove instead of flew. Right, there's some implications going on. Yeah. Uh <laughs> Trying to make sense of this show. But yeah, I Craig this child. (laughs) That's the next note that Emily has. Craig, 
this child. That's it. That's the only note. <laughs> I love him. And I'm like, I'm like, 100%. I am on board with this comic. <laughs> like, I don't even know quite what that means, other than that I truly, truly believe it. Uh, don't listen to the words. Listen for, to the story. Yeah. Uh, for people who missed, because uh, I'm not sure if we mentioned it in our scream something, and even if we did, here's a refresher. Especially if you didn't see our most recent appearance on DC Daily. Craig, for those who don't know, first appeared in the tie-in comics in the two-part uh, issues one and two uh, of the tie-in comics. He uh, went and found Superboy and accidentally gave him a residual memory of the cave that was the whole thing of Snapper Car letting the Joker into the cave. And he did it because he missed him. And I cry. I cry about this tiny <laughs> genome. He tries so hard. And so he does so good. good. And he's Connor's Doesn't oldest Superboy friend. Say like, he's the one. Like he's the one friend. who showed him what the moon and sun looked like. He's he that gave one. Him pictures of the sun. <laughs> and I cry. He's Craig so is a good boy, and I love him so much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it got into the regular episode. We were saying he's the baby Yoda of Young Justice. He's so cute. He's, he's so, so good. good. He's tiny. He rides on your shoulder like a shoulder cat. It's a good place. He's a tiny little <laughs> clone parrot, but like more adorable. Not to insult parrots or psych- anything. And powerfully psychic. And powerfully psychic. <laughs> right. And trying his best. Right. right. All the time. That's right. I love these one line notes you have. Beast Boy's good. Beast Boy's a good kid. And this yeah, Craig one, this child. I will be. Beast Boy's a good kid. <laughs> Craig, this child. Beast Boy is a good kid. Um, and I will be. Oh, I was like, I was going to be like, I'll be honest. I don't remember what this was, but I just remembered what it was. It's him transforming into like various possibly deadly animals just to entertain Leon. It's cute. Like Beast Boy, this isn't even your job. Halo's in charge of babysitting this child. And Beast Boy's just like, look, I'm a wolf. Now I'm a monkey. Now I'm your dog. And Leon's like, this is the best thing ever. Like Leon goes to kindergarten and everyone's like, what'd you do with your weekend? I know. Oh, yeah. No, they've taught their child well. I 100% believe Leon can keep a secret, considering she knew not to bring up superheroing in front of her in front of her aunt. Oh, yeah, that's true. Grandmother. Uh-oh. Grandmother. That's, right, I'm grandmother. forgetting relationships on this show. Unlike Jace, Leon knew not yes. to mention Artemis doing superhero stuff. Oh, I think Jace knew not to mention it as well. But you know Missy. what I mean. I do, I do. I'm just, Jace Watch is over, but it's never over. Never over. So, other things. Other things in the one-line notes of various things I like about this episode. I so appreciate this girl squad showing up to support Artemis. I like I like that they did that. I like that they, like, I get that it has a further implication upon the episode by allowing them to do the entire plot line. But I like that the initial implication is just, your friends are here to support you. Because you're going to do something that's... Not a great idea, kid. <laughs> and I also love the fact that they bring up Secret because we haven't talked about Secret since she happened. Like, the show never brings up Secret, even though there are so many implications inherent in that. Yeah. It, it makes me go back and rethink over that episode, actually. Yeah. About this, because it's Wally. I mean, it's, yeah. because of, Because it was specifically... Zatanna and Artemis. Like, did they plan this seasons ahead for this? I wouldn't doubt it. Couldn't have been more. I mean, there's a very, I mean, well, because it was an episode where I was like, well, this is, I mean, it's fun, like Girls Night Out, and it's like some stuff, and I get it, and Secret's cool. Um, I kind of like seeing them together. You know, like the the, the Zatanna and Artemis thing was great, but it seemed, it's always seemed out of place, and now I'm not convinced it is out of place yeah i absolutely agree and i love that it's even this passing like it's quick because so much happens in this episode but i like that there's this passing acknowledgement of how complicated that kind of proof can make the grieving process in like a genre fiction world like if you are acknowledging that yes this is a thing in this world and we have concrete proof that you both saw and definitely interacted with a ghost. You're like, 
wow, that's going to mess with your head a little bit, trying to figure things out going forward, depending on who you are as a person. (laughs) Yes, I would think so. Secret for season four, question mark, please. Well, then, so I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about this. So there's no, first of all, why not? There's no reason. She's not going to age. But also, she's not going to age. So, like, what happens if Secret gets introduced in season four? Say they get eight seasons, right? There's no reason. Secret's just going to watch her friends, like, just grow up and move on to other things. And then her age isn't going to change. But, like, is, does her maturity level change? Like, how does a ghost mature? Does it mature? Do they mature? Would she mature? Does she stay on the team and she's the only, like, consistent team member through, like, four seasons? Like, what if they go... Oh, shoot. That was that was Crash in the Mode. Never we'll mind. We'll put it in Crash in the Mode. But, yeah. Crash no, in the Mode it's, with it. We'll talk more about Secret and Crash in the Mode then. We'll bring her back then because I have some thoughts. But other continuing things. I love the Spitfire reunion. I love it. I love it even knowing that it's not real later because it's good. It's good and it's cathartic. And even like it makes you cry, but it makes you cry because you've been waiting for this for five years and the show finally gives it to you and you just sob. Yeah. And it's it's just like fail safe. It's not that it was fake. Yeah. It's not that it didn't it didn't happen. You process these things, particularly in these deep like she's not watching a movie. She's participating in it, in the yeah, experience, yeah. right? It's a deep, deep meditative spiritual experience that she's having to be able to cathartically process what's happening. And I know we talked about it a bit in Scream Something, but to bring it up again, part of what I love about the way they decided to do this episode was them having the explicit acknowledgement that everything that happened was not McGann and Zatanna's doing. They gave her a space and everything that yep. happened was Artemis is doing, which uh-huh. puts that agency back on her and makes me walk away from this episode feeling that and feeling how weighty and important this is, not going, well, this doesn't matter. Because like, if Zatanna and McGann had just fabricated all of that, part of me would be like, well, nothing that got said in there matters because that's not, that's just you telling her what you think she needs to hear and forcing that situation. Whereas having it be Artemis just filled in the blanks means all of that is how Artemis is feeling yeah. and it's allowing her to process that. And it's not what we thought it was, but it's something yeah. else and it's still important. Yeah, I do with this and Nightmare Monkeys and some other things that came up in the show. Like I want to time allotting uh, and schedule allotting. I want to get Greg on the show to talk about these episodes like these are deeply spiritual episodes. Like this thing that she went through is is cathartic, but it is it is reflective of certain meditative techniques, right? And in meditation where you are uh, letting go of the expectation of what's happening around you, but being present with the space. Like it's this balancing act between these two things that she's pulling off with the assistance of her friends, like matrixing, matrixing him, her into a space, but her choices are still hers. and. It, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. I would, yeah, we need to do that. We need to make that happen. He said he'd come on to do it, and we just have no time to do it. So it's it's almost like you're doing twelve things at once, Rich. Yeah, it's okay. You will still be able to talk about this after your Kickstarter's over. Wait for the mid roll, everyone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hi, I can be your hype squad. Yay. Uh, other things, other things from this episode, less existential in nature. Uh, my very insightful note here that simply says, Leon is a precious baby, and if anyone ever hurts her, I will riot. <laughs> Which I promise I ties into long. this episode. Cause this, this episode does a lot of interesting things with making you think something is going to happen and then having something completely different happen. Uh, which is a very yeah. long-winded way of saying that. But like at the very beginning, they have Lex Luthor be like, it's time to set our plan in motion. And then they have the voiceover of Leon bleed in. And I know I and many fans who know certain things from like the DC Comics lore about Leon were like, dear God, the light is going after this child. It is time to riot. And no, instead yep. she just gets kidnapped by a space being for two minutes and gets to float around in a location so unknown that even the timestamps can't identify it for us. It's just a space (laughs) skull. 
and the, it's yeah. just unknown. She's precious. That whole scene is so weird and interesting, and I and yeah, ah, uh, just even just uh, Metron just vaguely thinking of Halo and Cyborg as his grandchildren is so weird and interesting, and just that entire yeah. concept. He's like, yeah, you're the children of the mother box and the father box, so you're my grandchildren. I'm like. I guess that's how that works. Um, oh, goody. And they're just like, what's happening? And they just get dropped back. And I love Halo later just being like, it was a pretty average night. Like, she doesn't want to get in trouble, but also she's not wrong. <laughs> the fact that she's not wrong makes that even more ridiculous. But uh, other things to quick go back to the Geranium City plotline, because I love it. I love it so much in this episode. It's it's something I never expected, but love every second of. I love them showing how this got done. I love them using the psychic flashbacks again instead of just giving us dialogue to explain backstory. Like here, lore dump flashbacks. It's good. And just the idea that they've just been quietly building this little thing and expanding it and people just kind of come through for gas and snacks and move on on their day on their road <laughs> trip. But also, this this watch through, I had the revelation where I was just like, so Forager is joining the Outsiders. Who's on the team anymore? <laughs> Everyone keeps bailing on the team. Like, um, like I think by the end of the season, is it just Halo 13 and 13? Are they the only two? Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're like, well, <laughs> sorry, that was me about to go into crashing the mode. Uh, but yeah. Everybody, I think that all might have technically been crashing the mode, considering we don't know who else joins the Outsiders. But yeah, no, it. I was like, Forager, you're doing a good thing. I support what you're trying to do. But also, who's on the team anymore? It's also across the board. We keep saying how this episode acknowledges so many interesting things and raises so many interesting questions. Even just the th- the thing about calling out Connor and putting that focus on how he helps individuals and he is very good at that, but he is still unwilling and feeling unable to become like the activist that the genomorphs need or always thought he was going to be and having him kind of come to terms with that where he like, he brings Forger there and he's like, look, look at this great thing that we did and look at this great thing you can be a part of. And double X is like, yeah, no, it's great. You could do more though. And Connor's just like, Oh, I, Okay. Didn't he even in season one say the genomorph hero, right? Yeah. Something like that in the very first episode. There's the very first some season. like, cho- <laughs> I don't want to say chosen one because it's not exactly chosen one, but there's some like, you are the savior of your people kind of implications when Double X is helping him get out. He's like, you go, you get out, and then you help yeah. all of us. That's what you do. Yeah. That's what you're supposed yeah. to do. Right. And then Connor, but Connor's too busy being a 16 year old angst boy in season one because you can't put that on a 16 year old child and be like, hi, save everyone. And he's like, I'm trying to figure out how to have emotions and like <laughs> interact with people. And have I mentioned past- Lex is my dad? Yeah. Is the <laughs> Lex Luthor's my dad. My girlfriend is an alien. I'm trying to pass geometry. I got a lot going on right now. Not sure I can save an entire people yet. Yet. Uh, I do like how like he calls Nightwing out and then Double X calls him out, though. <laughs> but I like that they get called Everybody out on, get on called different out. things. It's not just like a full like hypocrite. Wait, is it, though? Fair enough. Expand. Expand on your point. But I think I see where you're going, in case listeners don't. That sounded a lot like Big Blue or whatever Nightwing says, and he says, "You know, I, I don't, I don't do teams or whatever." He's like, "You're already a leader. What kind of leader are you going to be?" That's almost literally what Double X <laughs> is calling out Connor on. Yeah, right? you're already out there. You're already doing things. What kind of leader are you going to be? Like, what are you, what are you going to do? But are to you be gonna... fair, he's not saying you're already out there because that's the thing. Connor isn't already out there. Connor is very much like up to a point didn't want to be a public hero so that's part of it so my interpretation is is a little bit back is a little bit backwards from that what double x is saying is you're a hero to us 
right here. Yes. You've helped, you've helped us build this community. You've helped us feel, you know, like we have a place in the world, but that's not leading. That's participating and help and holding us up. Right. This is not, you know what I mean? So this is where I, this is where I was thinking that it may be a little closer than I originally thought Fair about enough. this call yeah, out, no. you know, I totally, yeah. I totally see where you're coming from. And it's also the interesting thing of them being like, you've let us have a place in this world. You've helped us find this place in this world. You now you need to teach the world to have a place for us. Like he's like, now you got to do the other thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You gave us this space. We appreciate this space. We should be allowed out of this space. Yeah. And yeah, totally. I agree. The ending for the Wally and Artemis subplot in this episode is so beautiful and we've talked about it so much, but the two things I want to shout out are one, the music is gorgeous. And I know we keep bringing up the music. Like I think the second you you interviewed the amazing composers, we immediately were like, we need to listen more closely to the music. And once we did, we're like, it's it's incredible. Like we never we all knew yeah. it was incredible beforehand, but the second like you pause, especially on rewatches, like where I can pay attention to that instead of sobbing about the dialogue. Uh yeah. it's so good. It's all so good. Uh also crying about Artemis's reaction upon leaving, because she doesn't break down crying immediately. She smiles and she laughs and she says the the spirits did it all in one night before she starts crying which is a whole thing from Christmas Carol, which is just a beautiful way of looking at this because it's yeah. exactly what she does. And it's so good. It's also good. Uh, and to tie it back around to all of the things, I really appreciate, and I know me and many fans appreciated that uh, Will and Artemis's reaction upon like revisiting this is them both being like, yeah, no, this is weird. Um, and I know some people think Will may have just been agreeing with Artemis to make things less awkward because he does kind of have some nervous laughter and a weird little sad sigh as she walks away. But I'm personally going to interpret that until proven otherwise as him just missing his wife. Gosh dang it. Yeah, I, I'm, on, I'm on the same page as you, I think. Because, like, Artemis' whole thing is, like, you've really helped me open up, and this is great. Now I can move on and go forward with my life, and I've just had this whole existential experience with my boyfriend's ghost. Uh, and I don't have anyone, and I'm okay being single. And Will is just like, I'm married, and I miss her. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I get it. Yeah. You're single. I'm glad you worked all of that out. Gosh dang it, I want my assassin wife back. <laughs> And overall, as my final note on this episode, before we quick move on to Neil's things, which probably have some overlap with all of the nonsense I have been spouting for the last however long, I really love as an overall note that this is like this nice emotional cool down episode after like Definitely. the last couple of weeks that are just superhero fights and plot development and crazy wild stuff happening. And then we get this episode yeah. where it's like, you want to cry about season one? And I'm like, Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree. Uh, and this thing, it's been building because we're, all, I, I don't know. It was everything we needed, particularly with Wally. Something needed to happen. I got some stuff in Crash in the Mode, but like this needed, it needed to happen. We all needed something to move forward with this and get it wrapped up. And we had like lots of fights last episode. So many fights. We had more, we had enough fights for the. So many fights, on screen, off screen, all of the fights, everywhere, last episode. Yes, that's true. They were everywhere. That's totally true. All right, let's see what Neil has to say. So he, speaking on the Artemis uh, arc, he said the entire Will and Artemis arc has done so well. I think there was an attraction there that needed to be acted on in the way that it was to really show both people and the audience that it isn't the road that they should go down. This isn't a show that leaves those sorts of questions hanging forever, so I'm glad it happened exactly how it did. And that's, you know, you've talked about this a ton about like the dangling, you know, kiss or whatever, like you're waiting for season after season after season for some ship to happen. Right. And it's just and they don't do that here. Right. And it happens with other things besides the romantic arcs, too. Right. The whole thing we were just talking about in, on a recent episode as well about just season one going like, oh, yeah, I have this issue. Lex Luthor's my dad. And they just talk about it. And you're just like, oh, I thought that was going to be a thing no, for like five the seasons. Radical but oh, okay. I got... of communication. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, oh, uh, uh, this is great. Oh, all three of them. Yay. Right. So, I mean, I yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, Neil points out that there was another book, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Did you catch that? Well, it's something, it's something Forager brings up because Forager mentions he's like, 
the the glamour charm is an albatross around Forager's neck, and Connor just kind of looks at him and he just goes, Forager has been reading The Rime of the Ancient Mariner in Happy Harbor High School English class. <laughs> uh, to be fair, we never see the book on screen. That is true. So it has still that is not true. broken the I was thing like, that every I was like, book it... that we have seen on screen <laughs> is, is Adolfo. Because like, I'm sure we may have referenced other books, but the only book we've ever Probably. seen. <laughs> That's true. Okay, great. Because I was like, I don't remember seeing the book. Okay, gotcha. 16's population 216 at timestamp 2016. Geranium City was so epic and had come up in the series earlier, which I which I had mentioned with the geraniums. There's also a quick cut to the welcome sign at some point too. That's interesting. I don't remember uh, that. Double X, I don't remember that either. Double X feels like he was saving that speech to drop on Connor for some time. That did feel like he's been practicing. <laughs> yes, that's right. I was waiting for the right moment for this. There will come a day when Connor comes here and says something, and it will be the perfect, perfect way for me to start this <laughs> right. conversation and tell right. him that he needs to start doing more social justice activism. Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Wolf and Craig walking over to stand with him is the best. That was like, I'm like, buddy, all your buddies, all your buddies calling you out, even the ones who do not speak. 2052 timestamp for Brian's interview. He said, now he's in reference to the last episode, he said, it's got to be a team phone. Or it's to protect identities. Blue Beetle as a contact, right? <laughs> Not, yeah. Uh, the paper over the door is very interesting. It reads uh, somewhat like ambiance, but the Greek letter used, uh, used the Greek letter used in it are Sigma Omega Sigma SOS. Oh, interesting. There's no way the Markovs weren't in room 1616. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, and Craig makes an awesome little sleeping genome noise at the tail end of the credits. Which it's is... very cute. The, t- the credits, if you haven't been paying attention, guys, the credits on this one are Wolf cuddling Craig. And it's <laughs> wholesome. Yeah. For sure. Good napping buddies. Yeah. Okay, well let's get in <laughs> let's let's get into the middle middle of the show. We'll roll into some fan service uh, and crashing the mode. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we will be discussing what we can learn about the creative writing process from the episodes we review. This week, I want to talk about Catharsis, from the culmination of the Will and Artemis plotline to Halo and Cyborg's mini space adventure, to Artemis's journey of self-discovery, to the revelations about Geranium City and Connor's call to action. A lot happens in this episode. There's a reason it's titled Overwhelmed. But after two weeks of near nonstop action as two different teams faced off against this season's big bad in universe-threatening conflicts, this one actually feels like a breather episode. Within the framework of this season, episodes like this one allow the audience to take a step back, reconnect with the characters, and release the pent-up tension that knockdown drag-out fight scenes create. Overwhelmed is 24 minutes in which we can relax just a little, not fully of course, since the light is still planning something and we're still aware of that fact, but enough to not be on the edge of our seats waiting for another fist fight the entire time. Within the framework of the episode itself, Artemis's subplot allows her to finally achieve her own catharsis and closure over Wally's death. We've discussed the beautiful details of that scene at length. Everything from the acting to the music to the lighting is perfectly designed to make us cry our eyes out. But it still works perfectly to give Artemis what she, as a grieving character, needs. From a writing perspective, this entire limbo subplot is about understanding who Artemis is, how she would react to tragedy and trauma, and what she would need to move past it so that her character arc can continue and she can continue to grow. As a creator, you need to be able to interrogate your character's emotions, and when they hit an emotional brick wall like the one Artemis has been dealing with since the end of season two, you need to figure out exactly what the ladder that lets them climb over that wall or the tool that lets them break through it, actually is. For Artemis, it's the opportunity to literally face everything she lost, and in a roundabout, magically enhanced way, give herself 
permission to let go and move on. For other characters, it might be something different. You just have to figure out what works for them and what works for your story. Finally, within the larger framework of the entire series, this subplot is perfect catharsis for a fandom that has been mourning Wally in our own way since 2013. The moment Wally walked into the episode, I burst into tears. And when Artemis had to say goodbye, I was crying all over again. I wasn't the only one. Fans everywhere wept alongside Artemis over both the joy of seeing Wally again and the bittersweetness of letting him go. And as much as the whelmed team doesn't necessarily think Wally is actually dead, this episode gave us the explicit opportunity to grieve. <laughs> Fans will mourn the death of a beloved character just as much as the other characters will. So as a writer or creator, giving your audience, whether they be readers, viewers, listeners, or anything else, a chance to do just that can be a beautiful thing. So when it comes to catharsis in fiction, please just remember to make space in your narrative for both your characters and your audience to rest. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. This week, we actually have a cosplayer to share with all of you. They go by Dan Morish Cosplay on Instagram, and they have a bunch of amazing costumes and characters that they've done. When it comes to DC Comics, they've cosplayed as Nightwing, as Poison Ivy, and most recently as Spoiler. You know, my favorite, my favorite gal. You can check them out at the link that we will have down in our show notes uh, and send, send them a little love for all of their fantastic DC and other nerdy costumes. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come, based on wild flights of fan- fantasy. Wild flights of fantasy. That's the and way it should fancy. be. And imagination exactly. and tinfoil hats. <laughs> tinfoil hats. If you are spoiler wary, this is your warning. All right. Is this first one you or is that Neil? That's me. This is me. So I have I have some thoughts. So this we get we get to this thing with uh with uh Zatanna and everybody lying to Artemis. That's a whole thing. Uh a lot of people have not a lot of people, I've seen some people who've been like, How does this gel? How does this whole thing gel with the whole season ending speech about like we're not lying to each other anymore and we're we're gonna tell each other the truth and that's the only way the justice league is gonna work be like how does this fit together and i'm just like it doesn't that's the point we call that dramatic irony and it's gonna come back to bite zatanna (laughs) yeah like some people are like i can't but how would how did they do this how did they make such a mistake and i'm like no this is on purpose this will cause drama yeah and at, speaking of that, the idea that so Wally is grieved, yep. sort of. Yep. Artemis is moved on, or not moved on, but she's, she's able to processing. process things. She's she has at least not been started able to process really processing, before. right? So the only way, so yes, this is going to come back to bite Satana. Yes. The biggest and uh, biggest and almost only way I can think about it that it comes back to bite her. Is that while he's still alive? And at the beginning of this episode, I was watching it and I was like, oh man, wow, we're getting confirmation while he's dead. That's really cool. And then we got to the end of the episode and I was like, oh, he's 100% not dead now. Yeah. We've I know t- he's not dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not dead. Not we, dead. We super confused Hector Navarro when he was like, do you guys think uh, while he's dead? And we're just like, no, of course oh, not. No, and he's absolutely like, not dead. Why are you guys like, so what? sure? No, no, absolutely, absolutely convinced. 
And and it's got to come back because what is Artemis going to do? She moves on to someone else. Let's hope it's not Icicle Junior. No. And then like, no. and then it's Wally. He's also on the list of this is too weird. That's fair. That's fair. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking about earlier about Secret we're talking about that I started into and then I realized I was crashing the mode. So if Secret shows up and becomes part of the team, she doesn't age, right? She could be in, in seasons and seasons of the team. And then I realized, wait a minute, Secret could literally be in the 31st century as a member of the Legion. Yeah. <laughs> because I am still absolutely convinced Legionnaires are going to kidnap at least Superboy, if not the original team, and take them to the future. I absolutely believe that's going to happen. You have presented this idea to me several times, and I yes. have never... I have never really been on board with it until you went kidnap the whole original team. And now I'm like, oh no, now I'm on board with it. Yes, the original team. Get them into the future and guess who's going to be there waiting for them? Wally is going to be there waiting for them. So that then Artemis can just be like, Zatanna, meet me in the hall. Please talk about I would something. Like, <laughs> I would like to speak to you in this willow tree, please. Yes. This space willow tree. Space Willow Tree, but yeah, you the bringing yeah. up the whole mm-hmm. idea of like secret how secret could exist in so many seasons and all of that reminded me of I've I've read a couple of the old Young Justice comics off and on and have like read some things about them and whatnot and like that's a thing that's brought up every now and then like the whole thing similar to the whole thing with like Superboy doesn't physically age and like secret doesn't age at all because she's a ghost and secret has like a whole mini plot line of like. She falls in love with Tim Drake, and Tim Drake is like, you're a ghost. Um, this is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. If I'm remembering correctly, people who know more about that can correct me on that ship if they want. But like, that was a whole thing of like, Secret is a teenage girl, but she's only a teenage girl. And she can right, only right. ever be a teenage girl. Yeah. And how that affects her dealing with all of these people who are like, we are teenagers for now. And she's like, I am teenager forever. And he had, she and Superboy try to high five. Super, whereas Superboy has like the opposite problem. Right. They're, they're right. inverses of each other. That's true. That's true. And with that, I think we can say to Out of the Watchtower, thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube for conversation there, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.